All right, everyone. Welcome to our first lab session of uh, uh, CE 110. That's modeling and scheduling in, uh, in engineering. I'm your lab TA. Uh, my name is Jerry. So from now on, uh, you and I are going to meet every Thursday at this time at, uh, at this room to review some uh, pract practical components of the course where we learn how to schedule uh, and analyze the economic components of a project. My task is to help you to consolidate the materials that uh, we have learned in the lectures and to make it easier for you. Um, and my plan for the lab session is really uh, to conduct some group activity where we learn through um, real world problems. So we apply what we learn through the lecture theoretically uh, to some uh, practical problems. For today, since we have just learned linear programming uh, theory, we are going to uh, apply it in some real problems. Any questions so far? All right. So uh, I shared this lab notes with you through the Canvas announcement. If you have not seen it yet, please go to Canvas of the of our course and click announcement. There's one piece of announcement I made last week about lab sessions. And in that announcement, you're going to find a link to this document in case that you want to check it out later. But for now, you can simply follow me as I go through some important notes about the lab. Then we start the first linear programming problem. The lab session is graded uh, mainly by the participation. And here, the participation means not just that you're here. I usually do some group activity, maybe not this time. So that you're going to partner with at least one other student uh, to join a team of two or maybe more. Then you can possibly win some awards if your team wins. Um, but uh, the team activity is not graded by the correctness, since I understand that uh, your homework and exam are going to be graded, so I don't think there's, uh, there's more. Uh, it's necessary to bother you more about, uh, uh, you know, grading a, a additional quizzes and uh, homework problems, but instead I think group group activity will be fun and uh, also enough to help you get engaged with uh, all the necessary materials and the concepts that we learn through the course. And uh, uh, because of that, participation is important. And uh, since we have only nine uh, lab sessions in total, uh, you have uh, one free ticket if you need to miss. Uh, but uh, other than that, um, your grades might be affected. 
So you can win four points in the lab session of uh, that constitutes 20% of the total course grade by attending at least eight of the lab sessions once per week. And uh, I did realize that most students are very cautious about their grades. And uh, maybe you will also find tips for success in the course useful. And uh, my understanding is that first, you want to make your own notes. Uh, that way, you are not just uh, getting seated here uh, while listening, but you also remind yourself what you learn through the process. What's really important is that when you take notes, please use as few as words as possible. That means you have some mental processing in there, not just recording whatever I'm saying, but you need to process it so that you at least uh, understand it at least once. Uh, that's important because uh, uh, lots of research articles have shown that uh, uh, traditional handwritten notes and handwritten note-taking students perform better than those who take notes uh, on their electronic devices. But my understanding is that um, the reason is, is under, the underlying way how students process the message during the note-taking process. So even if you choose to take electronically uh, of the notes, but um, uh, you can still do a pretty good job by first processing uh, what you have heard before you record anything. I do that by, uh, I use Microsoft OneNote a lot. I found that to be very helpful, particularly because I can use the keyword to search, uh, especially for the important notes that I have made a while ago it won't be very feasible if I look through my handwritten notes, since I could have um, made notes of you know, hundreds of pages, even if I condense it to very few words. Um, so if you take notes, uh, please uh, consolidate. And uh, a second uh, tip I would like to bring is that uh, we want to do some self-learning through the process. Although my job is to help you to do this part, I still encourage you whenever in doubt uh, to use your favorite search engine and uh, look it up uh, for yourself. And uh, also it's important to learn through trials and errors since in our lab session, uh, there are two um, major software pieces that we need to learn, Excel Solver, and uh, Microsoft project. So if you are ever in doubt about any operation and uh, when you know that there are a few alternatives, please try each of them and uh, see what happens. Then you can make a decision which one is correct or which one is the best or easiest to implement. And uh, uh, in addition to that, I hope that you're good with equations because in linear programming, we are going to use them a lot. And in exams, particularly, you are going to be required to uh, formulate certain problems using mathematical ex expressions. You are all engineers, I believe. I, I trust in you that you should be good in this part, right? All right, uh, last one is about exams. If you need short tips about how to succeed in exams, mine is that uh, uh, I would do, redo the homework problems. This way, um, you are going to get familiar with the, the most important parts of the course. And uh, you also have a reference. The solution of each homework assignment, I believe, is going to be published. So you're going to see whether you may, uh, your results are correct or not. And if correct, whether you followed the same approach uh, as the solution does or not. <laughs> Uh, sometimes there are multiple correct ways to uh, resolve the same problem. So don't uh, panic if you um, achieve uh, the same results without using the same approach. Especially in, in uh, programming problems, we can formulate the same problem sometimes in multiple ways, as I can demonstrate uh, right away. 
before I start the linear programming lab session, any comments, questions, concerns about uh, the lab sessions? Hi. So we have uh, homework for the last session as well, or is this just like a review and going over stuff? Uh, no homework from the lab session. I understand that you already have, have homework from the lectures. I don't think it's necessary to consume more of your time outside of the lab session. My design is that uh, all activities should be, you know, confined within the lab session duration within 15 minutes. And uh, we have, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> 15 minutes passed. So no worries, no additional homework and uh, uh, your activity during the lab session is encouraged, uh, but they won't uh, be graded by the correctness. But the winner team uh, after this uh, lab session, next one, we're going to do some uh, group activity. Um, during that time, the winner team are going to get some prizes. I think this is a better incentive than, uh, than getting some, uh, you know, homework graded through the lab session. Do you agree? Um, okay, I think so. <laughs> I see some nodding heads, but uh, the other ones are indifferent. So that means the uh, social welfare in this classroom is at least not decreasing by doing the uh, group activity to win some prizes over the uh, quiz or homework grading option. Ah, that, it appears more uh, nodding heads. Okay, all right. Uh, now let's get started with uh, the linear programming part. I heard that some students find that the linear programming uh, components learned through the lecture looks slightly uh, uh, frightening. But through this lab session, uh, we should be good with it because as I understand it, there's no more than eight step, uh, sorry, uh, actually six, I think. Let me, okay. Yeah, six steps that we need to understand about linear programming, no more than that. First is that we want to identify some variables called decision variables. These are the quantities that could potentially affect our objective. So that's the stuff that we want to make a decision about. For example, that would be how many units of uh, each product of uh, different items that we want to produce if you are in the you know, production team. Or uh, if you are on the, uh, for example, construction team, which of uh, the building components you want to order so these are the decisions we need to make. And we need to solve this problem by um, using a, uh, well, uh, by using a uh, function called objective function. This is a function in terms of the decision variables. So if the decision variables are called X, the, um, the, Objective function is usually named the Z. So we want to get them in relationships so that Z is a function of X. And uh, this function is derived through the known knowledge from the problem setting. Uh, for example, as I listed in this list of uh, six items, the first one is that we want to extract some parameters from the uh, problem. These are usually the coefficients. So we can use this coefficient to formulate the relationship as a function uh, between Z and X. And after that, step four is that we want to provide some constraints. So I understand that uh, on both Tuesday and Thursday lectures, we have uh, been exposed to some concepts about constraints. These are no more complicated than a few inequality or equality relationship. So these are also some equations we need to formulate. And they are also in terms of X, the decision variables. Any questions so far? 
Okay, then uh, the step four is that we want to identify whether the problem is to minimize or maximize the objective function. This is usually apparent. For example, if the problem is uh, something about cost, we usually want to minimize the cost. If the problem is about some profit, we want to maximize the profit. And the last step is uh, after uh, that we formulate this problem, usually it can be done in two ways, both in words and also in mathematical uh, expressions. After that, we supply this problem. Um, sometimes this problem can be easy, easily uh, easy enough that we can supply it to some paperwork that we can solve it graphically or through uh, or by hand. But otherwise, in our lab session, for some slightly more complicated uh, problems, where we are going to take advantage of Microsoft Excel through the solver uh, add-in to solve the problem for us. And uh, the reported results are the optimal um, decision variable values and also the, this, the objective function at the uh, optimal decision variable values. And uh, there are also a few additional reports we can let Excel generate, but they are not really required in our course. But uh, if our time allows, I still encourage you to explore the additional uh, statistics and ranges reported through Excel uh, Solver so that we can learn in addition to the opt optimal solution, some other useful statistics and values um, to help us understand more about the uh, optim optim optimization problem. Okay, so these are the uh, six different steps in linear programming, no more than that. Is it, does it now sound as something that's um, um, achievable, uh, that's manageable for you? Okay, sounds good. Then let's make that. Okay, any question? So for linear programming, we only have the one objective function, we can't have multiple? No, uh, you're really in very complex programming. Nonlinear programming, we still have one and only one objective function. If you happen to have a few different, you know, criteria or objective that appears, Usually, the additional objectives can be formulated into the constraints. So, for example, if you want to minimize the cost at the same time of uh, uh, maximizing your uh, productivity uh, or the produce or the um, number of uh, uh, number of the units to produce, you can. Um, you can transform the number of units to produce into the constraints instead so that we still keep only one objective function, but uh, we incorporate the additional criteria into the constraints. All right, with that, how about we uh, make a practice problem so we understand how we can apply the six different steps uh, as easy as it appears into um, practice. Any question over there? Uh, possibly, let me think. Um, yeah, maybe a good idea. We should do that now instead of at the end of the class. But other than that, I think starting from next um, lab session next week, since we are going to have some uh, uh, um, group activities, so we don't need to do the uh, attendance sheet anymore because uh, you are going to turn in some piece of paper uh, that records your team work. All right, please hand over, write your name down so that I know you're here today. Just the name? Yeah, I think so. Uh, there are a few Matthews and Noans in our class, but I think I should be good if you give me both your first and last name.
All right. Practice problem. Now, congratulations, you are hired as an engineer for a city planning department uh, in this growing city. We are having a water supply problem. So as you can see on the shared screen, this is the problem formulation, well, problem hence usually appearing in your homework questions as well as your exam questions. So get yourself familiar with the um, typical phrases about a linear programming language so that you, you can identify the parameters from the problem hence, as well as uh, the objective from the uh, problem hence. So uh, let's read through this together. We are uh, currently using source one as the, as the uh, from a water reservoir. It's of a good quality, so the hardness is at uh, one, uh, at 200 pounds per million gallon. So I will omit the uh, units of measurement for future, uh, for future measurements. But the cost uh, is currently $500 per, mega, uh, per million gallon. However, for future development, we want to discover options about source two and source three as additional water sources. Source two is a uh, aquifer, but it's of a harder uh, water source of uh, 2,300. And the cost is uh, 1,000 per unit volume. As as you can see, all these parameters are given as a, a ratio, right, per unit, um, per unit quantity, so that they are understood as coefficients. We are going to use that uh, very soon to formulate our objective function. And uh, uh, source three is uh, through a stream that's of a very good quality, 70 in hardness. However, it's very pricey to acquire water this, this way because the um, unit cost is 2000. So as we can see up to now that we have two coefficients from each water source. One is about the hardness. The second is about the uh, cost. They are expressed per unit so that there are coefficients that we can time these coefficients with the uh, quantity of uh, the water we want to extract. And of course, we will soon see that the quantity we extract are the decision variables in this problem. And usually after these supplied information regarding coefficients, we're going to see some additional pieces of of information about the uh, constraints and objective. Let's go through it. So the city wants to meet the water demand. Currently, it's at least 150 per day. As you can see, this should be a constraint because we want to extract enough water to meet the demand. And uh, uh, another piece of information given is that there's some capacity from each of the source. From source one, we cannot extract more than 25 million gallons of water per day. And from source two, 120, and from source three, 100. As we can see, these are capacity limits. So of course they should be constraints, right? And the last piece of information is about uh, the um, total uh, hardness. So the total pounds of hardness per million gallon is limited to 1,200 uh, 1, per, uh, per mega gallon, right? Yeah, so for, for the blended water, we don't want it to be too hard. As you can see, 
uh, there are three components about the constraints here. And uh, usually your homework and exam questions will provide you a hint to help you to formulate this problem. In my practice problem, this is expressed as how much of water we should extract from each source to fulfill the daily water demand at a minimal cost. Sometimes uh, the, uh, some of the constraints may not be expressed explicitly in the uh, final question. So in this problem, for example, if I ask that we, uh, how much uh, water we want to extract from different source to fulfill the uh, water demand, or simply what's the optimal amount of water we should extract from different sources, we should still understand that uh, behind this um, explicitly expressed question, there are some components of the uh, constraints and uh, the objectives that's hidden. So even with even if I don't mention that uh, we want to fulfill the, the water demand per day, uh, if I don't mention that uh, it should be uh, fulfilled at, at a minimal cost, we should understood easily that uh, these are you know uh, uh, this should come along because uh, uh, at the optimal solution, of course, we, if there's some cost associated with it, we want to minimize it. If there's some demand uh, constraint with it, we should want to meet the demand, right? So even if we don't mention anything about the optimal, uh, uh, about the, uh, whether it's to minimize or maximize anything or to meet some demand or some constraint in the particular question, they should um, be understood um, automa automatically. So we should add these components. Let's see how we do it. So from the list of the six steps, we know that first step is that we want to extract some information from the problem. Here, as I demonstrated earlier, there are two coefficients from each source, right? One is about cost, the other is about hardness we can easily and uh, very efficiently uh, summarize these in pieces of information in a table. So we generally construct the table so that we have the decision variables on each column. And we have the coefficient names on the, uh, on the rows. So for example, for source one, we know that we were given that the per unit cost of the supply is 500 and the per unit hardness is 200. And in this table, we want to say that um, in column source one, the coefficient for cost is 500, hardness is uh, 200. So, in this table, there's no additional information that's not provided in a question. It's simply a, you know, a re representation of the existing information that we simply extract and summarize in that table through, uh, from the question hint. Any question here, uh, how I formulate this table? This table is, you know, not, it doesn't help us to get the um, solution directly, but it's helpful for us to formulate the problem in Excel. As you can see in our next group uh, activity that in Excel uh, solver, these are usually the table you can simply copy and paste so that uh, you can use the cell reference later. Any question here about step one? So this is how we can use the step one uh, extract parameter. Uh, and uh, uh, the result would be a table of all the coefficient. Here I also included uh, the supply limit as uh, 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 in this table. All right, upon completing step one to extract the, um, where we have extracted 
the uh, parameters to the problem. They are really the coefficients per uh, decision variable. Second step is that we want to uh, officially identify the decision variables. This can be done in two ways. In plain words, it will be that we say the amount of water to be drawn from each source per day is uh, x1 to 3. And usually we uh, follow it up with some mathematical expression. This can be most efficiently done through, use, uh, through the use of uh, some um, a subs subscript. For example, here, I call the decision variables xj so that the subscript j is equal to one, two, or three, representing uh, or indexing each uh, water source. So this is simple. We just name some variable. And in our problem, these are three different variables. Any question here? All right, easy step two. Now, uh, in step three, we want to use the decision variables that we identify, in, that we have identified in step two to formulate a objective function. So this objective function, of course, in our problem is about the cost that we want to minimize. So in plain word, it will be described as we want to minimize the total cost of the supplying water. And if we need to supply a uh, mathematical expression, it will be usually uh, formulated this way. So we put either minimize or maximize in, uh, in front. And we follow it up with a variable name. Usually it's uh, represented by a variable V. And we want to make an inequality relationship between the objective function and our uh, decision variables. As you can see, the, uh, the way I construct the table in step one helped me to arrive at the decision uh, at the objective function in step three. So that once we extract the, the coefficient about cost from each of the source, they correspond to the coefficients in the uh, objective function. Any questions in how I formulate the objective function? As you can see, it's nothing more than a simple equation between the cost and uh, the amount of water to extract from each source. And uh, this cost, of course, is a summation of cost from uh, um, different sources. If we have three water sources, the total cost of uh, uh, drawing water from uh, all these three different sources are simply the cost uh, of uh, drawing water from source one plus co uh, cost uh, of uh, drawing water from source two plus that from source three. So this is as easy as a summation of uh, the cost from each source uh, so that it, it becomes a total cost. And the coefficient is of course the per unit cost of uh, drawing water from each source. All right. So as you can see, step, step three is also fairly straightforward. How about step four? How do we incorporate all the pieces of constraints that we were given? As we uh, demonstrated earlier uh, through reading the uh, uh, prompt uh, of the question, we know that there are at least three components of the um, constraints. First is that we want to meet the daily demand, right? So our supply should be at least as large as the demand. And the second is we want to meet some hardness requirement. Uh, this means our water cannot be too hard. So there's a, a maximum threshold we want to satisfy. And a third component is about the uh, supply limit. So these cannot be exceeded. However, we should also get familiar with some non-negativity constraints that may not always explicitly uh, expressed in the problem. 
problem, but they are, of course, straightforward to understand. To extract water from each source, this amount cannot be negative, right? Uh, we can only ex extract water, but not you know, pump water back into uh, the source. So that uh, the decision variables representing the amount or quantity or volume of water to extract from each source should be at least zero. If we don't extract, it will be zero. If we extract something, it should be more than zero, but it, it should be never a negative quantity. All right, with these uh, four, um, the three apparent one plus the uh, fourth non-negativity constraint, they can be also expressed mathematically. Let's see how it can be done. They're not very complicated, but we just need to uh, form it correctly. For the total supply component, it can be expressed that the summation of x1 to 3 should be greater than 150, which is the daily demand threshold. So that uh, if our summation of the um, supply from each water source is equal to or greater than the threshold. We're good. Any question here? Right. Isn't that simple? So that's how a one of the component can be resolved uh, by formulating a, an in inequality constraint. But very important here is that we want to make sure the uh, direction or the sign of uh, the um, of the uh, operator is correct. So for example, here it says that x1 plus two, three is equal to or greater than 150. Do not you know, use a, a, an incorrect um, operator. Otherwise you will definitely, you will possibly get the uh, solution wrong. Okay, about the uh, hardness, how can we satisfy the hardness? Uh, constraint. In the question, we were told that we want to make sure the final water has a hardness no more than 1,200. One of a uh, very easy way is that we can simply say that the total uh, weight of the hardness, if we extract 150, that's the water demand daily, right? Um, so that if this maximum hardness uh, threshold is satisfied, the total amount of hardness we find in a blend water, uh, in the blended water, we will be 1,200 times 150, right? So that uh, our, that means uh, the quantity of the total hardness from our extract water, extracted water should not exceed this amount. So that uh, that's what you see here. If I use the hardness constraints on this row, uh, well, on the last row for each water source and uh, use the constraints uh, and use the, well, um, coefficients. In equation one, that's how I got that because 200 times x1 is the hardness we can get from the water we extract from uh, source one. And uh, from source three, because it's a stream, the hardness is very, very low. So the total amount of hardness would be 70 times x3. That's the product from uh, between the coefficient of hardness of source three and the quantity of water we extract from source three. All right, um, I got this because I used a trick that in this simple problem, usually the um, constraint is met at the corner. So if the, this constraint is greater or equal to the total demand at the uh, optimal solution, this is usually satisfied in a way that the the equality holds so that I simply use that x1, 2, 3 summed up uh, to 150. However, the correct way um, or the most correct way is that we want to make sure that uh, 
uh, we can include the uh, scenarios where this um, the supply can exceed the uh, daily demand so that we divide the total hardness with the quantity of water we extract so that that's the average hardness right then this amount should not exceed 1200 however as you can see here if i divide the total amount of the hardness that's a linear combination of x123 by another linear combination of x123, that's the total amount of water we extract from uh, three different sources. This is no longer a linear uh, constraint, but this can be easily transformed into a linear one by um, moving the denominator to the other side of the equation. Once we do that, we will see equation three, uh, equation two here. As you can see, this one is completely different than equation one. However, uh, equation one can be easily understood, but equation two doesn't seem to be so straightforward to interpret. However, this is what we got from uh, the constraint of the, the hardness. Any question in this hardness constraint? How about students in that? Okay, question. Let me show you. Uh, uh, it's not simply a subtract. So as you can see, uh, to get equation two, let's start from uh, where I begin. Okay. Uh, as I listed uh, previously, the correct way of expressing the kind of hardness constraint is that we want to make sure uh, that what's on the numerator is the total hardness, and on the denominator is the um, total amount of uh, um, or total volume. So that the ratio would be the average hardness, right? And uh, we simply put the total amount of hardness as a linear combination, as I listed in a shared note, because that's simply the product between the coefficient of hardness and the quantity of water we extract. And on the Denominator, that's the total amount of water we extract from three different sources. And uh, okay, let's do it here. This amount uh, should not exceed 1,200. That's the average uh, hardness, right? And uh, we simply, we acknowledge that the denominator, this amount, should be greater than zero, right? We need to extract some of uh, um, some water from uh, uh, each source, right? So the total amount of water should not be exactly zero. So using that, we can move this denominator to the other side of the equation so that we have uh, uh, this. And uh, we move everything this way so that uh, we have 200 minus 1,200 x1 and uh, do the, the same thing for each of the uh, certain variables. And uh, uh, after completing that, you will see that uh, this equation is exactly how I got to uh, equation two. So if you do these steps, make sure that you are not just subtracting, you know, 1,200, but uh, 
you take care of each term in the uh, equation. That should be easy to understand, right? Uh, yeah, I trust in you, your engineers. I assume your mathematical uh, capability should be good enough to understand this part. Unless you have a question here. All right. Now, hardness factored in. Let's see component. Uh, component three, yeah, of uh, the constraint. It's the supply limit. This is very easy. Each of uh, the desirable should not exceed the capacity. So we use uh, equal to or smaller than sign. And uh, the um, and these are the in total actually eight different constraints of inequality. So although in the question we were directly given, it appears to be three different components of uh, constraint. But if we express each of them, we can see that uh, we can count eight of them. So that this is constraint one, this is constraint two. You could also use this version, but I encourage you to use this more, you know, uh, more correct, but uh, slightly less interpretable constraint. And uh, this is constraint three, four, five, um, and uh, uh, six, seven, eight. So we do want to factor in each of the inequality or the capacity constraints plus each of the non-negativity constraints. All right, uh, we're at the end of our lab session. Any question before you leave? Okay, question. Uh, I don't understand. Well, what do you mean by first equation? Oh, okay. So return me the uh, attendance sheet. Uh, okay, where's the attendance sheet? Thank <laughs> you.